Thanks for coming out. Uh, for everyone who's not familiar, this is Burning Books, the place you read about in the news. Um, <laughs> we are happy to announce our 2014 speaker series starting up this month. I, if people don't know specifically, we work to bring in speakers such as Peg Millett um, from anywhere around that we can bring them in. Peg is all the way from Arizona this time, so it's a big deal. Um, bring them in from around the country to sort of bring different perspectives on freedom struggle and activism and justice um, to Buffalo here from around the country and around the world. And we bring in speakers about eight times a year, and then we have other people who come in who are on tours that we that are looking for places, and we say, yeah, come on, in, come on, and we'll host you here. But we we thanks thanks to your support of everyone here in Buffalo and, and this great community that we have, we are able to raise enough money to uh, bring people like Peg in and do these kind of events. And this is really a very really special thing that hasn't happened in Buffalo quite some time. I don't know if it's ever really happened before and uh, it doesn't happen in most places in this country to tell you the truth. Um, so it's kind of a it's kind of a big deal and I just want to thank everyone again. I always thank everyone but it's just never quite enough. So I just want to make sure that everyone really understands how much we all appreciate the support that uh, that this community and the people of Buffalo give this bookstore and we're trying to give it back to you in every way that we can and one of the ways is with Peg here tonight. Um, so I just need to run through a few things. Uh, before Peg gets started, um, so yeah, this is our 2014 season opener. We'll have events. If everything goes correctly, we'll have events in January, which is right now February, March, April, May, June, uh, September, and October. Those are the months that seem to work out good for us. We don't conflict with holidays, don't conflict with the hot days that nobody wants to come and sit inside the bookstore. Um, and we hope to make these some of the, the more memorable types of things that you go to throughout the year. So I just want to, again, make sure everybody realizes that we, that, um, that we really appreciate all the support. A lot of people chipped in money to make, to make this happen. A lot of people chip in money regularly. And we pass the hat. We'll be doing that tonight. And everything you put in there really makes a difference. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you're not too familiar with us, we have a mailing list, which is here. I'll pass it around in a moment. You can get on it. You get an email once a week. It's nice and pretty, and it tells you everything that we got going on. No biggie. Sign up if you want to have the feds monitor you. A <laughs> uh, couple things coming up. February 5th, Songs of Freedom. This is one of the events that's already touring that we decided to host. Um, the, a couple uh, historians and, and, and musicians did uh, a, a bunch of songs and wrote a book on James Connolly, who was involved in the Irish Republican struggle and was executed by a British firing squad uh, after, East, after um, what do they call that, Easter Uprising um, in the early 1900s. And it looks like a really cool, musical, fun, unique event. And it's going to be here on the 5th. Uh, the night after that, we have this fight for economic justice, which has Betty Jean Grant and Richard Libbets oh, cool. at it. So that would be kind of different for us and interesting as well. Um, I wanted to talk about this thing very briefly because it relates closely to Peg's situation, except it's more contemporary. Uh, this is Move Marie campaign, which is new, and this is Marie Mason. Um, we're going to be, pe there's some info up here on the table about it, we'll be passing some around. But um, Marie Mason is a current prisoner who's involved for, uh, who's in for Earth Liberation activities. She's in a 20 year sentence. She actually uh, did commit a million dollar arson against Monsanto. Um, and their genetic engineering experiments, and, and along with a number of other actions that were claimed by the Earth Liberation Front, and she uh, got made an example of quite harshly by the courts, and is doing 20 years, and if you don't realize how serious that is, most people who rape and murder don't get that. Um, so, Marie is currently being held in the most restrictive prison in the U.S. for women, uh, Carswell, in Texas, and she is classified for medium security. So, which means a much more friendly type of facility, much more tolerable. But because she's a political prisoner and they don't want her to communicate with activists and so on, they stick her in this extremely restrictive prison and we're trying to get her moved. Um, Burning Books is actually in, on the sort of um, coalition of the Move Marie campaign. So if anyone hasn't checked out Marie's situation, read this. And if anyone wants to sign one of these postcards and leave it with us, we'll put the stamp on it and mail it, or you can take them and send it yourself, whatever's cool. Marie is a good friend and a wonderful person and really needs your support. And I think that having Peg here tonight is going to give you an example of what Marie is 
uh, kind of liking what she's all about. So, um, <laughs> so it's really something special that we have this. And ironically, it is Marie's birthday in just a couple days. So, and she, she has children. Yes, she needs to get out she of prison. She has little ones. Yeah. So, um, one last thing before I introduce Peg, we have. I actually wrote this book a little while ago, thanks to Peg. Um, it's a history of, of her case, and a lot of you have probably seen it, but if you haven't, we're giving them out free tonight to all you people because we love you. And, uh, and Peg is going to be signing them because she loves you. So, <laughs> so uh, please take a moment to grab one of those. Uh, I did spend some time on it. People seem to like it, um, and it's got some great pictures of Peg inside, and it tells a really awesome story about her experiences and a lot of lessons, and it's really great. So check it out. So with no further ado, I just want to introduce Peg Millett. She is so many things, and I keep learning more every moment I'm hanging out with her. A, uh, an amazing, natural, horse-raising person. Uh, somebody who is very, who is going to provide an awful lot of entertainment and education to you tonight. And of course, um, you know, one of our favorite things here at Burning Books, she's a Fallon. And a uh, former political prisoner, a saboteur, and all around... Uh, and proud of it. And all around hero. So, uh, <laughs> welcome back with a big bustle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you know some of my story or maybe a bunch of it. Um, I was arrested with four other people and then there was another person. Well, I was arrested with three other people in 1989 and I was, uh, and then one of the other people that was involved with us was arrested six months later, and so we were called the Arizona Five. Mm -hmm. And we were set up by the FBI. Um, I had my very own FBI agent for, I would say, a couple of, about a year at least before um, we got busted. And I was doing what they call monkey wrenching. Mm -hmm. I was um, involved with a group called Earth First, and Earth First has been, it started in in about 1980. And so um, I was going to college in 1980 and um, I found out about them by reading an in interview with Dave Foreman in the Mother Earth News. <laughs> they had the Plowboy interview and I read it when I moved out to the mountains in central Arizona um, and I was working for the Forest Service and I was a firefighter for the Forest Service. And my um, soon-to-be husband was also a firefighter, and he was living out there. We lived in an old cabin that was built in 1874. And when I read that interview, I had always felt a little at odds with everyone, including all the horse people and everything that I was involved in. And when I read this interview, I went, there's another person that thinks like I do. And I couldn't believe it. So I went to the Ron River Rendezvous, which was happening on the Uncompahgre Plateau in Colorado. That year, it was 1985. And um, the reason why I married the fellow that I married is because he drove me to the highway <laughs> on his motorcycle from our house, which was 17 miles away from the highway on a dirt road. And he dropped me off with my backpack so that I could go to the Ron River Rendezvous by hitchhiking, because I didn't have a car that could do it. And so I realized then that um, he was probably going to be okay to get married to, because he was willing to allow me to be who I am and to go and do what I do. You guys want to sit down? There's places, anywhere. So that's my first exposure to Earth First. They were a bunch of rednecks and mostly um, environmentally oriented people who um, came out of the, the, uh, the big um, environmental organizations like um, Wilderness Society and Sierra Club. And Dave Foreman was uh, one of the founders and so was uh, a guy named Mike Roselle. I don't know if any of you guys know either of those guys. But um, Mike is still out there kicking ass and taking names. <laughs> and he's down in the, in the Appalachians right now and he's working on the coal situation and uh, mountaintop removals and all that kind of thing. Um, Dave is still out there. Um, he's more of a speaker and not quite as active um, oriented like uh, Mike is. But there's all of us, this is like years and years ago, I'm just like, oh my god, this is such a long time ago. So, 
I got involved with these folks and I didn't know that there was a lot of people as far as I was concerned that thought in this way and so and my thing is I love street theater and getting outrageous and that sort of thing and so I got involved with them and Earth First at that time was very oriented towards fun as well as getting our point across and in those days politically the media came out to us and they actually filmed us and took pictures and actually put it in the paper. And so when we were bringing attention to something that was going on, it was actually put in the paper. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. And you have to do it on Twitter or Facebook or something like that. And the political climate has changed so much that I'm going to be telling you stories that are totally not relevant anymore. But I will tell you the experiences that I went through and how it affected me as a person and how I bring it into my everyday life because I live kind of a stealth bomber existence now as uh, somebody who's, people don't know my history. People don't know anything about my history. People that are my age don't know my history because they never, you know, they might have heard about us and thought, oh yeah, those terrorists that were going to bomb, you know, the nuclear power plant, which is how, the, how we were depicted in the, in the media, but that's not what happened. So anyways, I got involved with Earth First, and I got really um, rather involved, in, and we did a lot of street theater back then. It was a lot of fun. Um, our big projects down in Arizona area were Mount Graham. They wanted to just level the top of it. It's the last Scott Island left um, that is from the Pleistocene era, and it's got, you know, these beautiful trees and sienegas and all that kind of stuff. Like, it's got... It's a, it's a paradise <laughs> for... Um, and a, and a really wonderful place for biologists to study, but it's also the sacred mountain of the Apache people. And it's, um, it's where they had their spiritual centers. That's where they got their connection and energy to uh, their cosmology. So, um, so we worked, I worked with people, um, in Mount Graham was a really big deal at that time. U of A was gonna try and put up all these uh, telescopes and the Vatican was going to put up telescopes, Max Planck was going to put up tel telescopes, and so Earth First was the only group of anything, of anybody, that was willing to say, we're not going to let them, and they were like, oh yeah, sure, we'll just swat you like a mosquito. Well, we, we were very, you know, mosquitoes can keep people up all night long, just one, in a room. So um, so we might have been little, but by golly, we, we kept their attention, and um, and as a result, there is one telescope on the top of Mount Graham, and they did not level it, and they did not block it off from the public and all that kind of stuff, and that's over 20 years ago. Um, what ended up happening is the native people, the, the Apache, um, some of those folks woke up and said, we got to go and do this because this is our mountain. And these little white guys over here are just, you know, they're making noise. So what ended up happening is we got a big coalition going, and the lots of people from the native um, um, communities got involved with us and we got involved with them. So that meant we got involved, we would come to them and say, okay, we're at your service, what would you like us to do? And then they would come and they would do their runs up there. They start, they reinstated um, their, their, um, their ceremonies that were involving them going to the mountain and coming back and all that kind of stuff. So that was really huge stuff. The other end of the state, that's down in the south, down towards Mexico, and the other end of the state where I was born is up in a place called um, Flagstaff, and there are the, the, the San Francisco peaks there. And those mountains are part of the cosmology of all the people that live around there, the Pueblos, the, um, the Hopi, the Navajo, the Ute. Um, people that were living up there, the Havasupai, the Hualapai, um, all the Pai people, the, the, even the, the Yavapai people would look to the peaks. They are an old mountain um, volcano that blew its top over 10,000 years ago and there's this humongous crater that they call the, the inner, um, you know, where, where everybody goes to make their connection with that mountain and that's where, to the Hopi people, that is where their um, the Kachinas come from. And so they come from there and then they go back in there. So half the year they're in this world and the other half of the year they're in another world and so they're in another dimension and everything. And so that mountain was threatened. Um, it was um, 
There's a ski lift on it that was put up there maybe 75 or 80 years ago by some people that lived in Flagstaff, and so they were skiing down there. And the thing about the peaks is our snow doesn't last all winter, oftentimes. It's 12,000 feet, but we get snow and sometimes we don't get snow. And so, um, so what has been happening is they've been trying to bring more tourists and that sort of thing. And what they ended up doing is, and this is just recent, when I was doing the activism there um, with Earth First, we were trying to keep some of their, they had a uh, pumice mine that they were going to use, that they were going to put in there so that they could make those jeans that people were walking around oh, yeah. and they had, you know, the, the white. It's like, oh, anyway, I'm not going to wash. Yeah, snow wash jeans. <laughs> To me, it's just like, what? But anyway, I, you know, I'm a country person. I don't, you know, we wear jeans until they wear out, and, they, right. and they're usually like that for a long time. But anyway, um, we buy them when they're really blue. <laughs> so, um, so what we were doing is we were connecting with sacred lands issues. The peaks are a huge um, part of the cosmology of the Navajo, and, um, the, and the Hopi and the people that live in that area that were there before the Europeans came. And so all the things that I got involved in, mostly in my area, because we have a really huge um, amount of native peoples that we've displaced, um, is sacred lands. Because, and so these lands were the ones that were getting trashed. So what ended up happening is they found in the Brescia pipes, in and around the Grand Canyon, and um, up towards the peaks, but not far from there, some of the really sacred grounds of the people of Havasupai and the Hualapai, their birthplace, where they came out of the underworld when they emerged into this world that we're in now, is at Red Butte, which is where they were going to put the canyon on. So I got involved with, so what we were doing in Arizona with Earth First was mostly fighting for these places that, that were sacred places for all the people that were before us. And of course for us, who are there and know and can feel it, and all lands to me are sacred. And so, um, and I was born there. So I got really involved with the Arizona stuff mostly, but I was also involved um, all over the country with Earth First. And I was, you know, I would. My favorite costume was the rac raccoon costume um, because I connect with and have a strong affinity with the raccoon and they inform me a lot about my own, like how I'm going to proceed somewhere. I, I usually try to bring up that raccoon energy. And so I was always seen in the videos and all that kind of stuff. I was seen as a, as a raccoon. And I went to jail as a raccoon um, oh. in 1987 <laughs> when we had a rendezvous up at the North Room of the Grand Canyon. And I had been involved all the time. I'd never been arrested. I'd been involved always as uh, somebody who was the, the dog person that followed whoever was going to jail. Now, in those days, we went to jail for five hours. And they turned us out. It was like, well, we can't really do anything. You guys were just, you know, singing songs and locked yourselves <laughs> onto a door. So, what are we gonna do? <laughs> so they really, and it was, it was all kind of, there was this sort of camaraderie going on, even with the sheriffs. I mean, I have a picture that you guys will see in this little pamphlet of me wearing a raccoon suit that the sheriffs took in Fredonia when we got arrested and when we went to jail. And they gave me the picture. Is it here? This is a good one of you. So... <laughs> It was, you know, we had this, and they, you know, they came to our camp when we were getting ready to do this demo yeah. for the uranium mine, against uranium mine, and they said, we want to know how many people are going to get arrested so we can bring in the paddy wing for enough, you know, to, <laughs> so we told them, because it was civil disobedience. Yeah. It wasn't things that went bump in the night, but civil disobedience is now a crime too, mm -hmm. and a major crime, and people are going to jail for a long time for that kind of stuff. So. It's, to me, it's like, oh my God, I'm telling this story and it's just quaint because mm -hmm. there's serious shit going on nowadays. But anyways, at that time in Arizona, in the, up in the, the north part of the state, um, so in 1987, I got real involved and so I got, and I had a lot of fun and, and I would go out for weeks at a time from my little house in the mountains um, with my husband who was the Forest Service guy. 
<laughs> and I worked for the Forest Service for a while, and I was a firefighter and all that sort of thing. And I kind of, and the Forest Service at that time there was very much kind of keeping an eye on me because they were starting to get this fear stuff from the feds. Feds were, they started following Earth First around in 1980 when they first rolled a crack down the face of the, of the Glen Canyon Dam. And that crack was made out of neoprene or something like that. It was just black and they took a picture of it and Ed Abbey was there and he was standing on his, the back of his truck and pontificating and, and the rangers were laughing and joking with us and drink beers with us and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden the feds were involved. And so what ended up happening over the years is they started, they were following us constantly, but we didn't know because we're very naive. <coughs> I was very naive. I was entirely naive. And I thought of myself as a tree hugger and that's it. Mm -hmm. I'm just a a person that lives out in the woods. I work with the foresters and I want to see the trees standing and I want to be able to breathe the air and I want to drink the water. So that was my whole focus. And in 1987, um, I went to the rendezvous. I was on the committee. We put it on. There was 500 people that came there. Um, uh, Mike Rosell was, was uh, going to do the nonviolence training and um, he said who's going to get arrested and this was the first time that my hand went up and it was because I was born in that country that's my home so I said okay well I'll try this and of course I didn't tell my husband and I wasn't <laughs> there for three or four days and because I ended up in jail and we ended up there was 19 of us that went to jail some people went and got up on one of the head frames of the of the mine and they um, were, you know, rock climbers and adventurers, and they were climbing the, the thing. And the rest of us uh, that got arrested were wearing animal suits and staying in front of the, the ore trucks that were coming out. So we shut down the mine. It was called the Pigeon Mine. We shut it down for uh, a day, and um, and the cops came. It was the it was the uh, uh, the highway patrol was the one that was the most aggro because they didn't like driving down those roads that got their cars dirty and because you know, they're very clean and they don't like to have to do this stuff. The sheriffs were way more easygoing, and <clears throat> so I had so we, there we were in a line and there's Dave Foreman on one side and his and his his wife was with me uh, Nancy Foreman and and we were all on the on the road. And uh, do you guys know who uh, there's a guy named John Seed? who uh, is also uh, one of the most amazing activists I've ever met. He came from, he actually originally came from Hungary and then he went to Australia when Hungary fell and he was there for many, many years and he was a Buddhist and then all of a sudden his, the trees all around him were getting felled and he was like, wow, well, what's going on? And he woke up and did a, a film called Earth First years and years ago. and. Um, he was there and he did things called the Council of All Beings. Him and a lady named Joanna Macy got together and they put together these um, councils where people got together as, um, we got together in groups as um, uh, representing the animal world. So he was there at that rendezvous, it was his first rendezvous and here's a bunch of us and this, you know, guy comes in and he's got a billy club and he's going to go thump on us and and so me I'm not very good at being um, shall we say complacent or compliant and so um, he was coming at us we were on the ground you know hooked into our arms and everything with each other and he was getting ready to just start knocking heads and what I ended up doing was sticking my feet in between his feet and knocking him over so he <laughs> fell down on top of us okay <laughs> skid his arm or something, I don't know. But he was going to sue me. <laughs> and um, and I said, well, fine. Go ahead. Like, I don't have anything for you to sue. And I said, I'm going to go to court, too, because I have a skinned arm. And so what ended up happening is we went to jail. Um, my dog person did not bring me clothes. I just went to jail as a raccoon. So <laughs> while we were going to jail, it was a five-hour drive, um, we're in this bus and we're all chained together and as we're going down the road in this bus we're going to go over the um, we're going to go over the, the um, bridge right in front of the Glen Canyon Dam and so of course all of us are all Abbey fans and we're all are thinking about that precision earthquake so I started singing songs about the precision earthquake and so um, I also um, sort of am a song leader and um, so I started singing about uh, like a lot of these um, 
songs like We Shall Overcome and some of the songs that they were singing down in the Mississippi summer and we had some black cops in the bus and so I'm sitting, I mean I was pretty bold and daring. I didn't, you know, it's, it's all in good fun but I'm sitting with this black cop in, in front of me <laughs> And I'm a raccoon. I said, so, from one, as one coon to another, <laughs> he started laughing, and the white guys that were driving were just really mad. <laughs> and they weren't going to let us pee, and they weren't going to let us get out and do anything until we got there, so we're all like, no, until for five hours. And it was just, oh. But I, I always, there was always a cop in there somewhere that I could get to, to just kind of get him to laugh. And when you get him to laugh, I don't know, that's, that's really... A big deal, but I had a, a really um, interesting experience when I was 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 doing that, and and all of us, you know, we're janking our chains and we're making all this noise, and they wouldn't take us around there again because they had us in Fredonia, and then they were going to take us down to Coconino County, and then we had to go back up to Fredonia to go to court three days later. This is the first time that Earth Firsters had to stay in jail for any length of time. Most of the time, we were just in jail for five hours or whatever, and then they kick us out because they were like, well, what are we going to do with them? So what, what that was was the beginning of, of the end and the beginning of the real um, push from the FBI. So at the same time, I'm working for the Forest Service. I'm, I'm working as on, on the engine crew uh, for fire, wildfires. And my husband, um, I'm, not, I'm just working seasonally. So my husband's working all year round, and he comes home with this stuff where he's, they're getting all these, um, all these uh, memos and they're getting these like instructional things that they have to go to and listen to and they're, they're just getting militarized. It's really weird and it was happening down in the 80s mm. when we were getting, um, the fear mongering was starting to happen and they were starting to really try and make us into terrorists and we're all just a bunch of rednecks and we're having a good time and we're laughing and we're joking and we are locking ourselves down and we're, we're making coffee on the side of the road and we're giving it to people and, and giving them little pamphlets telling them what's going on in this particular situation and trying to educate people. We had a, an oatmeal spill at the Grand Canyon which depicted <laughs> what happens when those ore trucks fall over and um, you know all the, the uranium mine that was going on in and around the Grand Canyon was on most, it was on, it was over uh, um, BLM lands Forest Service lands, um, native lands, and um, and park lands, and um, and some private lands, and so there was no one agency to talk to to change what was going on. Energy Fuels Nuclear was the one that was handling it. There, I don't know if it's the same outfit, but they're still trying to get uranium out of the Grand Canyon right now, and we ended up. Um, you know, just doing all this stuff to get people to see what was going on. And in those days, it got in the news. I have, you know, the paper articles and stuff like that from that. that that's not happening now. So anyway, I was involved with all of that kind of stuff. And then I met a guy named Mark Davis, who I thought was a little weird, but he um, wanted to, to do things like take out the... Um, he wanted to take out the pylons at the ski lift that they were going to privatize, and they were going to, um, the ski lift has been going on for about 50 years by that time, and, and what they were trying to do is privatize it. Uh, Fairfield bought it. They were going to make it um, inaccessible for, you know, Joe Blow, and they were also going to pave the road, they are going to make new ski runs, and all this kind of stuff. And this is sacred lands, and, you know, up until that time, the native population was not organized enough at that time, and so, you know, all the big groups like um, the Sierra Club and the uh, Wilderness Society and all those guys, they're like, oh, we can't do anything about it. It's just too far gone. And Earth First is going, oh, I think we'll do something about it. And so we did demos and, and had all kinds of stuff to get the information out. Mm -hmm. And that, in my naivety, was what we were, you know, we were going to get the American people, um, they were going to be educated and then they were going to change. And I was like, well, that hasn't happened yet. But anyway, um, so I got involved. So then the next thing we know, they're having powwows up there, and there's all kinds of folks that are starting to, um, that actually, um, there was a really great powwow that happened where 
the people, the Havasupai people, put out a call to all religions. So we had people from everywhere that were representing different religions. People, we had Tibetan Buddhists, we had all kinds of folks from everywhere on the planet show up at this powwow. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend Ilsa and I um, were really, really involved in doing work with the uranium mining issue. She had a couple of kids. She was horrified at what she was finding out about uranium and how it was um, affecting all of the uh, communities up in that area. Um, they had been mining uranium for years and years up there in Utah, in um, Colorado, in, in Arizona, in uh, New Mexico. And the, the legacy that they had left even then was really bad. And so, um, so there was three of us. There was Mary. Uh, Soldier, who is a wonderful author and also an activist, and then Ilsa Hill, Washington, and me. She, uh, she was Ilsa, Ilsa Asplund. And so the three of us put together a ceremony, and uh, we had been to the powwow, and we asked the people there if it was okay if we came to the mother place, which is where they were going to put this, this horrible head frame called the Canyon Mine. And uh, they totally gave us their blessing. And when we got out there to do our ceremony, we found a, a great big chunk of salt, which is one of the things that the house you might bring up and um, leave as offerings up there. And so we took that as a sign that they were, they were sort of endorsing us. So we did a ceremony up there on the solstice, winter solstice, in 1987, I guess it was, or 80, I think it was 1987. And it was very effective. There was already a 17-acre um, in-holding that they had um, a head frame set up. They had people that were coming and going out of there regularly. There was miners there. Um, they had not put the, um, the shaft in yet, but they were all set up to do it. And so we, um, we had the most amazing experience up there. There were about... We put the word out that we wanted women to come because we're going to take back the female energy and we're going to bring, you know, get the serpent uncoiled. And so um, we had a lot of, um, shall we say, resistance from the boys in Flagstaff. They didn't want to come and just be our support. They wanted to come and beat their chests and beat drums and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, you guys can do that, but if you just take care of the kids and make sure that the fire's going and that there's food, We'll be fine. We'll go and do our ceremony, and you'll be our support group at the staging area. And they, we had two guys come. One was the informant, and the other was um, Mark Davis, who is my famous co-defendant. So, um, so the defendant or the the uh, informant, uh, his name was Ron Frazier. You can read about him in here too. Um, Ron Frazier got involved, I believe, personally way um, before he came to us. I believe that the FBI had him under their um, pay scale when he, he showed up in Prescott. He had been kicked out of, um, out of Bisbee, which is in a little mining town down in the southern part of the state of Arizona, and he was kicked out of the mining town um, because he had been arrested for child molestation. What? He'd been arrested for assault with a deadly weapon, and he had been arrested for uh, beating a dog. So animal cruelty, child molestation, and, um, and assault with a deadly weapon. So he was out of there, and he had those on his record. They are not on his record now. And so I believe, and this is what the feds do, they're wonderful about this, they'll get somebody that's pretty down and out, they'll get somebody that doesn't have a spiritual core, They'll get somebody that is, um, well, usually they don't like addicted people so much, but he liked, um, he liked LSD a lot, and he also liked pot a lot. And they kept him in pot and LSD all the time that they had him under their, under their pay scale. Oh. And when we went to trial, we, um, our lawyers, thank God, got a five-hour video of him being hypnotized by the FBI <coughs> in Texas wow. to, um, to turn him because he was starting to come into our camp. He was starting to, because we took, we were nice to him. Yeah. I mean, we were the nicest people he ever met. He was not stable emotionally. He came to the house that I lived in a lot. 
Um, I lived in, you know, with my husband, um, um, Doug. And um, he was a very, very talented artist, really talented, metalist, metal artist. Um, I have a piece that he made, and I still have it because it's um, the triple goddess represented in the triple spiral. And I just like, I just keep that to remind me <laughs> that there's good in everything, no matter how bad it is. <laughs> and there's bad in everything, no matter how good it is. Like there's a balance, and so. Um, so Ron Fraser got involved in, let's see, he was there in 87 when I decided to be part of the Ron Rendezvous committee, the FBI opened an office in the bottom of the, the um, town square at the uh, courthouse. They opened an office that summer. So that's way before we were ever doing anything and we went bump in the night. So they were following us around way before we ever did anything. So we were doing lots of things that were totally up front. That was all like um, civil disobedience and, you know, like Thoreau. And, you know, our model was Thoreau. And, and so we used a lot of street theater and all that kind of stuff. But the feds were after us before that. They were getting us set up so that they could come in with COINTELPRO and work us. And so that was in 87. We um, did this ceremony in 87. That, um, where there was about 35 women that showed up and there was two men and the two men did do a very good job of keeping the fire going, having some food for us and making sure that the kids were taken care of because all these women, half of them had children and so they had to have some place to put them. So they had a really nice staging area, we had a big fire going and so everybody was fine and um, we did this ceremony. It took some hours, we went barefoot, it was snowy and we danced um, a spiral dance around this 17 acres. And um, we didn't have a plan. Uh, Ilsa, Mary, and I sort of set it up and put it out there. We didn't have a plan. It all just, we had a vision, and each of us sort of had something in our minds, and all the women just did those things. Like, I, I was hoping that somebody would have a fire at the gate. A lady comes in, just sets down, puts a fire at the gate, right in front of the gate. So all these people, all these miners come driving in, because we told everybody what we were gonna do. The sheriff knew, the miners knew, everybody knew what we were gonna do, and they, they showed up, the sheriff was there, and they got bored and left, because we weren't doing anything that was interesting to them. We had a group of women that just started to drum and sing. The rest of us, we did the spiral dance all the way around, and then we just ended up in this circle, and then when the, when the miners got bored and they wanted to leave, they had to open the gate, and we had such an intense um, influence on them. I mean, it was a really powerful ceremony. We had such an intense influence on them that the guys that were going to open the gate, oh, they, were, they had guard dogs, and the guard dogs were very friendly <laughs> to us. <laughs> so, um, so we had, they had to open the gate, and in order to do it, they had to go through this uh, fire that this woman had as a, as a vigil there. And so they came very, very respectfully, and they brought their shovels, and they moved the fire so that they could open the gate so that they could leave. The fire was still going. They didn't just put it out. And so what we did is we just made a little amoeba around them of women, and we held our hands, and then we, we told them our names as they were driving out. So we would open up so they could come in, and then we would go with them until they went a certain direction and then the, the open it. And we did not talk about this. We did not say, I mean, we're there and Mary's like, let's just tell them our names. So we told them our names. And they were just like scared to death at first. But then they realized, I mean, it was really powerful what we were doing. And so <coughs> that place still, 20 years later, has not had a shaft put in yet. They're still, they're thinking about it. It ended up going away as a threat, when we went into jail, I was thinking, oh God, it's, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm thinking that I'm going to be influencing things and that it's going to be because of me and my cohorts that we're going to stop that. And I didn't realize at that time, I was just very grandiose, that um, it's, it's not about me and it, that it's not about my little um, intention or wanting that to happen. It's, it's a bigger thing than that. And so I had a lot to learn. 
But anyways, we did make a big impact on the people that went in there because they were looking at us as the enemy. And that's one of the whole things that the feds are trying to do is make an us and them. And there is no us and them. We're all us, all of us. And so that's the one of the things that I've learned over the years. I'm in, I'm in prison and I get guards coming up to me and go, how come you're so goddamn happy? And I go, well, I, I would say the first reason is because I didn't get in a car to drive here myself this morning, which you did. And so, <laughs> so think about that. And um, so the, the, that ceremony happened, and as that ha ceremony was happening, the FBI informant was there. He was taking care of the latrines, which I thought was a perfect job for him to do <laughs> after I found out that he was an informant. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting how they had sort of like set the stage and then when we stepped into that role of we're going to do things, we ended up um, some months later, I think the next year, or no, it's, I, I can't remember what the chronology is, but we ended up cutting power lines going into that uranium mine. And um, I think three of them went down. And there were three of us, or four of us, that were doing the work. There was Mark Davis, Mark Baker, myself, and Ilsa. And uh, when we did it, the whole woods was crawling with FBI agents. They saw us. And I, had, I actually met someone that I worked with her at a shelter, a youth shelter. Years later, she had about five kids, and she had been camping in that very neighborhood the night that we did our dastardly deed, and, the, and she said, I couldn't believe it, there was cops everywhere. We couldn't go anywhere without being running into a cop. And so they knew that we were doing this, but they didn't have enough on us to stop us, and they wanted <coughs> us to keep going so that they could put us out, you know, for a long time. So, and I was so, so mad. <laughs> so we did that, we also, um, Cut the, power, go, cut the pylons um, at the ski lift. Um, I can't remember if that was before or after. I think, I can't remember. It was a very intense situation. We had um, um, Dave Foreman, or uh, Mark Davis was a, um, was a, uh, he didn't know how to use a, a, a settling torch, but he, he learned <laughs> so that he could cut these, these bolts in the pylons so that they would go over. And so when they did, um, we were, we were, they didn't fall when we were there because, um, you know, you had to wait for wind or something like that. It was just that they were still standing. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, we couldn't cut the, the, the cable, which we were going to do, but that didn't happen. But uh, it's, we spent a lot, they spent a lot of money on getting the place cleaned up and fixed because we um, rendered it impossible to use. So... Those were things that we did. Mark Davis was the mastermind in these, and he um, came to me after the rendezvous. I was in charge of all the, um, uh, of the, uh, what do you call it, the um, recycling, and, and uh, I wanted to, another rendezvous I went to the year before was in, <coughs> was in um, um, uh, Idaho, and at that rendezvous, there was, there was a, for the stage, for all the music and everything, we had the Austin Lounge Lizards and a bunch of folks, um, they had a, a generator and I said, aren't we supposed to be ecologically minded? Can't we get one that's made, you know, that's like a solar generator? Can't we do that? So we got a solar generator when I was doing the rendezvous and so I've, got, I've opened my big mouth and I ended up being the rendezvous. Mm -hmm. the yeah. So I took, I did, we had this big, I had this great big, um, trailer that I borrowed and we borrowed a big tank of some friend of mine that had to live you know out in the woods and he had to have his water tank and all that kind of stuff so we borrowed his water tank so we could have something to get the fires out and all that sort of thing and so I was going down to Phoenix I didn't know what I was going to do I needed to um, drop all the stuff off and then I had to take all the stuff back to Flagstaff where I borrowed it from and, and I ran into Mark Davis who went to the rendezvous and He'd been trying to talk to me about doing things that went bump in the night for a long time, and I finally cornered me, and I found out that they were going to start doing a, a, a campaign to get all the predators around, and there's a animal damage control, which is a, it's a, a governor, government agency, and they go around and, 
and trap and kill whatever predators they possibly can, and it's just stupid. And so he told, I got a phone call from somebody that worked in the, in the county. She said, I don't know how, what to do, but I know they're going to do this. And, and I was just beside myself when she told me. Um, she said, they're not telling the papers, they're not letting it be known, so they're doing this under underground, and, and they're just, you know, trying to do this. And so she outed them about it, and I ended up getting on a phone tree about it, and um, because Mark Davis taught me how to do that. He knew how to do, he was a, um, he was on a hotline with, um, for uh, people that are suicidal and stuff like that. And so he taught me how to do a phone tree on the public square, and so we went and did a phone tree, and then um, word got out, and, and the, they couldn't do what they were trying to do with the, with the funds and all that kind of stuff, and so um, he helped me get all that stuff up to flight, and he just did a bunch of work with me, and then he asked me if I wanted to go and take out the ski lift, and I thought, well, we've been talking about monkey ranching for a long time, but I've never done anything but just cut down, you know, billboards and, you know, put sugar in gas tanks of the great big um, D-cats, you know, D-9s and stuff like that. And so I thought, well, let's do something more organized. So that's what got me started. That was the stuff that went bump in the night. That was the illegal stuff that we were not going to get caught for, of course. Yes. And the feds were way, ready, ready for us. They were waiting for us to do something. And so then they started tracking us. Then they sent uh, me, an FBI agent, to use me as the port of entry, is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the port of entry is, uh, they got me with this very handsome FBI agent who came along and was going to, he went to the rendezvous in 1988. <coughs> um, in, and that was in Washington State, and that is where I met uh, Rod Coronado for the first time. And Rod Coronado, at the young age of 19, sank two uh, whaling ships that were Icelandic whaling ships. There was a moratorium on whaling, a, a worldwide moratorium on whaling, and nobody, the, everyone was, had stopped whaling except for Iceland. And so he was on the Sea Shepherd, Paul Watson's little boat, um, big boat, and he was in, they went to Reykjavik, or what, I think that's what they call it, and, and he just, with his buddy Dave, they went into the, the two whaling ships and just pulled the plug and sank them in the Whoa. harbor. Um, and then he was 19 years old when he did that, and, and, and then Dave and he went to, they didn't do the third ship because there was a man on it and they didn't want to hurt anybody, so they went to the place where they did the processing of the whale meat, and they completely trashed it, $100,000 worth. And so the next day, they stood up in front of the world and said, we just did that, what are you going to do about it? This guy is hopefully coming up here, so you will be very, very honored to, to, to see him. This guy is amazing. But anyways, that's, that's where I met him for the first time, and of course I couldn't tell him what I was doing because I, it was illegal too. And um, then there was, and I'm, I, you know, Paul Watson was there, but also so was the FBI agent, and so was the informant. And the informant introduced me to the FBI agent, and so Ron Frazier introduces me to Mike Fain, who calls himself Mike Tate, and I had gotten a ride up to there, but I did not have a ride home. So I was going to find a ride with somebody that lived in Arizona. And, you know, I was kind of a free bird in those days, even though I was married and had a place in, in Arizona. And so the FBI agent came and offered me a ride oh, with <laughs> the FBI informant. <laughs> so I'm very don't know. I mean, he's very handsome and he's just really tall dark, and quiet and he's, you know, he's kind of like taciturn, sort of like the cowboys. I, I used to be a rodeo person and I went to all the rodeos in Arizona for years when I was a teenager. And so he was kind of showing off as a cowboy kind of a deal. And so I went for the deal and I, I went with him down to Arizona. He gave me a ride up to my house so that they could look at it. The cool thing is that the feds could not put bionic ears around our hearts because we saw everything that was going on. And so if there was someone in the area, we knew it. And so they couldn't take a truck or anything without us knowing that they were driving around out there. So they couldn't sneak around up there. And so they didn't And I was living in Forest Service housing. It was owned by the Forest Service. So they couldn't, under law, put a bug in our house. Huh. They could 
because of Ed Meese, put a bug in Ilsa's house, Ilsa's bedroom, Ilsa's bathroom. Um, they could put a, a bug in lots of other place, places, but they couldn't put one in our house. So they don't have anything about... And then my, my husband, bless his heart, he didn't have anything. He, I just told him that I wanted to get in, more involved with this stuff, and he said, I don't want to hear any more. <laughs> shut up. And I said, okay. But he didn't... He was very supportive just because he didn't uh, try to stop me. And uh, he, well, he knows he couldn't try to stop me. But anyway, um, <laughs> he just knew that. So that was how, that's kind of how things got started. And uh, I was involved, the FBI agent was there now. He was uh, involved for about two years or three years. The informant was involved for maybe three years. And uh, there were other informants that were happening down in Tucson. Um, the FBI wanted to involve Dave Foreman, who was not involved with us at all. Mm -hmm. This is all just people up in Prescott. My friend Ilsa was involved because she got together with Mark Davis. Mark Davis was the one that got me talked into doing this in the first place. And then uh, we, we knew this guy named um, Mark Baker, who is a botanist, and he worked extensively in South America, and he did a lot of uh, papers on the sex life of choyas and that sort of thing. And so <laughs> he was also very interested in doing some of the things that we did. And he and I did some really great stuff at night where we took um, a lot of billboards down around the um, nuclear power plant that we're talking about some big development that they were trying to put together and so we just you know spent the night taking down all these really because it's really good boards really nice wood and so he and I spent that night taking a lot of these down so that we could you know he made a, a house for his kids you know <laughs> <laughs> so we we were doing things together we had a great time it was wonderful and when the FBI agent um, he continued to um, I had a major crush on him <laughs> and um, he was really good at dancing, and I love to dance, so I had a reputation of dancing. My beloved husband did not dance, he was oh. shy, and so um, when I went out and did all this stuff with Earth First, and we were, you know, we were over in uh, Yellowstone, we were all over the freaking place, and um, usually when we were done, you know, there's, there's, you know, it's been an adrenaline rush when you've been, you know, in jail and a bunch of people are trying to, you know, we were doing all these demonstrations and stuff, and so we would usually go out to some place like the Cowboy Bar and just <laughs> dance all night, and so I had a reputation for that. I don't drink, and I don't smoke. Um, I would drink a little, but I never got drunk because um, it was, I don't like that feeling. And um, I come from a long line of alcoholics. <laughs> and I did drink. And in 1980, I woke up in my own vomit in Ooh. a bathtub and I had the dry heaves for five hours. And I went, yeah. you know, I think I'll stop doing that. And so I did. Um, but that, I, it's a family thing. I have, all of my relatives have problems with alcohol. And, and uh, so, I, um, but I am pretty flamboyant and rowdy, and so I don't have to drink to get rowdy. So um, I did dance on tables, and I was pretty rowdy. And so the FBI sent me a guy that knew how to dance, and um, and he has, you know, he gave the illusion of being a cowboy. Um, he came to my house a lot when I lived out in the mountains, and with my husband. And my husband did not like him. He was an, oh, he was a guy that worked for the Forest Service. He was a he was um, he was a really nice man, and he's living in Oregon now with a, a much more domestic woman um, <laughs> that is um, happy to be a domestic person, and I am not very good at that. So, um, and he he really did uh, freak out pretty heavily when I got arrested and um, ended up in jail and all that kind of stuff. It just really tore him up. So he asked for a divorce after that, and. Um, I was like, well, how much I can do about it? See, I'm going to jail. So um, I was devastated. I did not want to get divorced. But, but Doug knew instinctively that he, was ha that he was talking to another government man. He knew that. He didn't like him at all. And I thought it was because he might have been jealous or something. But no, he really, in his heart of hearts, knew 
But Doug loves the, the, the wild and he loves the earth and he's, he was somebody that really, his support of me was by allowing me to be able to do this because I didn't have any money. I mean, I, I've never had money. And he, we lived on like 15000 a year and that was the most money I'd ever seen in my life. And so I was able to like get magazine subscriptions and stuff like that. And, and that... I've never been able to do that. I've lived out of my car and I hitchhiked for thousands of miles and I lived in a backpack for years. And so being able to do that gave me the freedom to be an activist because I didn't have that before. And a home base where I could go and, and get my strength up again. Um, and so that was, that was his gift to me. And, so, um, and also his gift to me was the fact that I was married and I wasn't going to do something stupid with somebody I wasn't married to. So, um, so the FBI agent worked me very heavily. They do psychological profiles. Wow. That is why they sent me a guy that was sort of a Westerner, kind of a guy that was handsome and, and uh, sort of, you know, John Wayne-like, you know, quiet and taciturn and all that kind of crap. <laughs> because they knew my history. Mm. They, every, you know, any time I had a, a job somewhere, I worked at the racetrack, I worked riding colts, I was a horse person, I was a cowgirl, I was somebody that was very involved in the rural lifestyle of the West. And they sent me somebody that would, would um, speak to that part of me. And because I was around a bunch of rowdies that were also um, not necessarily a lot, you know, a lot of these folks, um, when I got involved with them, I was studying natural history. I was very involved in, in um, you know, uh, learning about the world around me, about biodiversity, about bio, just all of that. And the groups that I was with, the Earth Firsters that I knew back in the day, that's who we were. We were all college educated. We were all white. We were all... Um, middle class people and so um, Dave Foreman and, Mar and um, um, Mike Rosell and uh, Howie Walk were all people that lobbied in Washington. They worked in Washington for the big 10 um, co uh, conservation groups and they were so tired of watching over and over everything getting compromised. You know, those guys are just a bunch of wimps. And so they went down to, to, to Mexico and, and they were, you know, drinking in some bar somewhere. And they said, we are so sick and tired of the, you know, corporations first. We want the earth to be first. And so that's how it started. Mm -hmm. and, it, and so I, that's where my people, that's my roots and that kind of stuff. And so the FBI sent me one that would you know, speak to me. So one of the things that I tell people, I spent like about five or six years after I got out of prison telling my story mm -hmm. to audiences of activists and saying, I want you guys to go out there and kick ass and I want you to be very aware of who you are with mm -hmm. and how you are acting. Because if you don't have a spiritual focus in your life, if you do not have a speak and walk and, and, and um, have a connection with the planet, you're going to get in trouble. And um, if, if you let the ego come in, if you start playing with the alcohol and the drugs, it's over because you're going to lose your center. Mm. And they don't have a way. That, there's a lot of really nasty stuff that, the, that the, these groups, and it's not just the government. It's like the corporation. The government is just like the dog of the corporations. The FBI is just the dog of the government. So they're not, it's not them. In fact, some of these guys that I met that were FBI agents were like feeling bad for us because they didn't like what they saw happening to us. And yet, you know, they, they're, they were not empowered. And so those was, and the, the other thing that really I tried to really instill in people is if you are afraid, they have one. I mean, if you let fear walk in front of you, they have one. And so, um, one of the songs that I sang when I was in prison all the time, and even before that, is a little Wiccan chant that I got from the collective, the, the um, uh, what do they call it? They're over in, um, the Reclaiming Collective over in San Francisco. It's a really simple little song, and I'll sing it to you right now. It goes, Where there's fear, there is power. Passion is the healer, desire cracks open the gate, if you're ready it will take you through. 
and nothing lasts forever. Time is the destroyer, the wheel turns again and again. Watch out, it will take you through. Hmm. Where there's fear, there is power. Passion is the healer. Desire cracks open the gate. If you're ready, it will take you through. And nothing dies forever. Nature is the renewer. The wheel turns again and again. Watch out, it will take you through. And if there's fear, there is power. Passion is the healer, the wheel turns again and again. When you're ready, it will take you through. So that song was sort of like my anthem when I went in because I was very afraid of, um, of all the stuff that was going to happen to me. I lived out in the middle of nowhere. It was quiet. It was dark. And, um, and that's not where I went. So... Um, so I got involved and we did those things and uh, the FBI was involved with us and they were following us and, uh, and they finally, uh, the night that we were going to take down some power lines that were from the CAP project, which is a project that happens over in, um, they, they take water from the Colorado River and they take it uphill so they have to pump it. Mm -hmm. And so there were power lines coming from the, the, the nuclear power plant that were going to these um, pump stations. And so we were going to take out a power line that was at a pump station. So it wasn't going to mess up the hospital. It wasn't going to ha mess up the traffic lights. It was going to mess up the pump station. And um, the FBI was with us the whole way. The, um, <laughs> Mike Fain uh, was involved with us because of me. We would go out dancing. My husband was a firefighter, so he went off to fire, fight fires in Alaska and, and other parts of the country because he was on the fire crews and they take him out everywhere. And so I'm alone at Palace Station, which is, you know, 17 miles from the nearest house. And um, I'm in the middle of the forest. And one day I am home. Doug's been gone for a month. He's going to be gone another month. And Mike Fain, who gave me the ride down from the rendezvous, shows up at my door and says, um, and just comes in. And I'm like, oh, that handsome guy from the rendezvous. So he comes in and he, we are having this really nice conversation. He's like telling me he's really interested in all this activism and all this other kind of stuff. And, Oh, I know you like to dance, and maybe we should go dancing. Now, I had never danced with them. I didn't know. Oh, or maybe I had danced with them. I can't remember. But anyways, I do remember that um, I was like, wow, okay. So, there were red flags that I did not pay any attention to. Mm -hmm. And one of the red flags was he was driving a really stupid truck. <laughs> if he's a redneck, he's not going to drive a truck that's like a six-cylinder to take him up these big hills and it was not a four wheel drive mm. but it was some drug dealer's truck mm. and they confiscated it and gave it to him and said that's your truck so he shows up in that truck and i'm like well that thing doesn't have any guts in it because we were going to drive to town in it well it couldn't get up the hill <laughs> so i'm like god so i said well uh let's get my truck because it happens to be a real truck <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm a badass. <laughs> the ego. Big, big, yeah. fat ego. Okay. So, um, so we walk back from his truck because it stopped. And so it's like a mile or so away to get to the house. And we're walking. I got my little dancing shoes on, you know. And I'm walking along and I go, ah! And I jump up and there's, there's been a, there's a, a centipede that went over my foot. And I went, oh my god, it's a centipede. It's a flashlight. Because we're not walking with flashlights. I don't walk with flashlights at night because we do a lot of shit at night that requires no flashlights. So um, I was practicing, right? And so, uh, so so this guy gets a flashlight, he looks at it, and he's going to stomp the shit out of this centipede. And I'm like, oh, what wow. are you doing? I push him away. I go, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? He goes, well, I was going to stomp the centipede because it, it bit you. Like he's going to be chivalrous or some shit. Oh, really? And I'm just like, really? I said, um, red flag, I mean, yeah. huge red flag, yeah. huge red flag, 
I did not pay attention to it. Why? Because he was so nice. He was so mm. handsome. I was alone for a month. Mm. I was really starved for attention. Mm. He shows up. He he knows. He knows exactly. Except he still didn't know. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. So I glaze over that one. I'm like, what an idiot. But we're still going to go dancing because I really want to go dancing. <laughs> so that was, the, that was the second red flag. Um, I can't remember what the third red flag was, but there was a, another one. Anyway, so we get back to the house. We get in my truck. We drive to the town of Prescott, and we go to some place. And this son of a gun can really jitterbug. He knows how to country swing. He knows all the stuff I knew in, in when I was a cowgirl, going to the dances and stuff like that. And he just was so amazing. <laughs> so when I talk to people that are activists that are doing things that might not be that might be targeted by the FBI for any reason or at all, it's like if somebody in your life shows up and is too good to be true, they probably they are <laughs> too good to be true. <laughs> So, um, so that was, that was, so that was the beginning of the end for me. They have 800 hours of me, because I love to talk, as you have already figured out. 800 hours of me talking to this guy, telling him my whole life story, oh, telling him all this shit. Now, this is before I learned I'm an incest survivor. This is before I didn't know this about myself. Um, but they did somehow because of their they are really smart and they know really well how to learn about the psychology of people and how to manipulate people with that the thing they don't get is the part of the umbilical cord to the planet if i mm -hmm. did not have a really strong spiritual life i would have been mm -hmm. in the same place that ron fraser was when they got a hold of him and hypnotized him because he did not have that center, and he was um, run by drugs and alcohol and that kind of stuff, and so um, so that is like that's like my plea. Whenever I was talking to anybody in the day, and this is, I mean, the story I'm telling was history because it really isn't. I mean, it's relevant today because that stuff is still going on. It's even more intense, like this last green scare, all that kind of stuff that's going on, um, where people. Like if in a, in if a treaty falls, people that were um, brought for I wasn't really involved with um, things at the time. I got taken out of circulation for about five years. We got arrested in '89. Um, it took them a long time to get their trial together because they really didn't have one on us. <laughs> We're the over the hill gang, and we were like really bumbling idiots, and so they really couldn't get us for criminal stuff. They wanted to get us on um, on um, uh, conspiracy, but they couldn't. Even though Ed Meese made it totally possible for them to to uh, do the consensual tapes, that's what they call it, consensual tapes. I'm consenting to be taped. Mm -hmm. But um, it was because the FBI agent and the FBI informant were consenting to wear a bug. That's what that's consensual tape is about. So they had hundreds and hundreds of hours of one person talking to an FBI agent and one person talking to an informant, but no two of us or three of us, no, none of us did that. We always spoke to each other at the park or mm -hmm. somewhere where there was no way that we would be monitored and it worked that way, it was very good. If it wasn't for the fact that I had an FBI agent that I fell for and brought into my oh, group, yeah. <laughs> This not this stuff would not have happened, and, and that's exactly what happened to the people in in the the if mm -hmm. a tree falls and I don't know does anybody here has all of you guys seen that movie or mm -hmm. it's one of the most amazing I was like oh yeah that's that's our story only um, when I got out well I was in there for I had a, a three year sentence um, with um, my crew um, we were. Uh, a couple of years waiting for all of these tapes to get processed. We found a couple of tapes in there, in our um, archives. We found tapes where the FBI agent himself was outing himself on tape, and that tape we were going to use for evidence against the FBI when the time came in the trial. The trial was two months long. 
Um, everyone in my group that was arrested and, and that were my co-defendants had children except for me mm -hmm. and Dave Foreman. And they did not want to spend the next 12 years dealing with this shit, which is what exactly they were going to try to do, is they were going to try to drag it out as long as they could. So we did a plea bargain. And I know people have gotten all mad at, uh, at uh, Rod Coronado for going in a plea bargain too, and he did. But the thing is, we could, they couldn't get us to implicate anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so that was the thing that was really devastating about what happened with these folks, is that people rolled. Oh, yeah. And they rolled because they were desperate and because there was some, there was some lack somewhere. And, um, and they were afraid. And, and that was the thing. We were too, maybe too naive to be afraid. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not. I mean, they put me under the lights. The thing that happened when I, um, the next thing we were going to do was going to take this power line down. The FBI was involved. Um, he went out and did the recon. And when I was dealing with them, uh, when with Dave, Mark Davis and I, we would do recons together. And so we would be up. We went to the top of the peaks to look at the, at the ski lift. We got up to the very top of the peaks, it's 12,000 feet, and we, and we were there at night, and we walked up and back in the dark. So we didn't have flashlight or any that kind of stuff, and it's, it's a long haul, it's 18 miles. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's how we did our recons. And so Mark Davis is not a student of natural history, he is uh, just a radical kind of guy. And so I was able to kind of keep us on the straight and narrow and to, and to be more practical. He wasn't very practical when we did this stuff. And so I was the recon practical person. Well, the FBI informed an agent who went and did the recon with Mark Davis <laughs> was doing it as an ambush. Okay, so where would be the best place we could ambush them? And Mark Davis didn't see that. When I got there for the first time, um, when we were going to do the thing, the dastardly deed, I show up and I'm driving in there with him and I'm going, Mark, we're in a bowl. Where can we have a lookout? There's no place for anybody to be looking out. And, and I'm like, this doesn't, this doesn't look, so, but they were looking at the, the pole itself and it was one of these great big high, high tension power line tire, towers and they were going to cut through these I-beams. Oh God, it's just so bad. So, so <laughs> Mark Davis, and me, and um, I don't think Ilsa was as grandiose. We called her the gun mall because she was just balls to the walls, just let's go, and she was wanting to do stuff that both Mark and I were like, no, no, not that, not that. But um, she hadn't been doing that much with us because, I mean, she, she and I and Mark and Mark were all out when we cut down the power lines going into the uranium mine, and that was a fabulous uh, explosion we saw. The, the what happened is when when the fireball started when we hit the the when the the lines hit the ground and then it just traveled along the, the lines for a couple of miles until it hit the um, the head frame uh, the, the the compound that was 17 acres and it just blew out all the lights mm -hmm. and it was just the most amazing thing I ever saw <laughs> I'm not sorry I saw that too for let me tell you and, and we had to it's like we had to because high tension power lines are kind of scary when you, yeah. I mean, that was one of the things, it was like, you know, are we really, should we really do this? Because it was very foolhardy and silly to try and take down these big power lines. We were just taking down the little um, T lines when we went into the power line, and, and that was very scary, and we had to do it on a corner, and, and one of them got down on the ground, Mark was on the ground just with a little um, <laughs> saw in the on the wire, you know, that holds up the thing where you know there's a tension there. Oh. So when that went, they all went, and so it was very exciting. We cut them all, um, uh, almost all the way through with our with our hand saws, and um, <laughs> we did about 27 of them, and uh, spent a long time that night with the FBI all around us, you know, <laughs> looking at us and not doing anything to stop. And we didn't know this until we were in the trial years later, and there's, uh, there's the mining guy, and he's sitting there, and, and so we get our, our lawyers come up there and explain to the mining guy that the FBI was already out there, and, they, and the mining guy was completely freaked out because he thought they were on his side. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. But anyway, so, 
it's like, sorry guys, <laughs> they're not on anybody's side. <laughs> so, um, I just like the way. <laughs> so it was really interesting, um, and it was exciting. And so when we were going to do the big tension line, I had gone up to Montana right before that, and they had a um, Montana um, is a big, mi uh, big um, timber country, and there was a uh, there's a school I think it's in. Uh, God, where is it? Missoula, Montana, and they had a uh, the environmentalists there were going to have a a mock uh, lumberjack uh, days kind of a thing. Only they were going to have like um, stake pulling and and uh, things that were <laughs> not you know log rolling is is what the lumberjacks did, but we were doing other things, and so. I was there for that and I spoke and sang and all that kind of stuff and then after I left every house that I had gone into got raided. Uh, so freaked everyone out. Of course the feds were in there and they just tore the whole, everything apart and so all the people that were up there that were innocent you know, bystanders were just getting racked over the coals and so they were freaked out at us because you know, we had caused this to happen. And so when I came home I knew without a shadow of a doubt that something was really, really wrong, but I was still smitten with the FBI agent. Oh so, um, so the night of the big, uh, of, the, of the thing that we, that the FBI, you know, the night of our big um, ambush, I knew my body was just telling, screaming at me not to go, not to go, not to go. But I felt responsible for my fame being involved with us, and I knew I had to go. So I was really scared, and I knew something. It was like I was on this really on the crest of a wave, and I wasn't going to be able to get off of it, and I was just on it. And I knew it. And on, in some level in my body, I knew it. And my heart and my soul. And I was in denial about it. And so I went. Uh, the FBI had the ambush, they had a Black Hawk helicopter in the wash, they, um, you know, we're down there and, and here's Mark Davis got his hat on backwards and he's going to go and cut this I-beam and the FBI agent is standing right behind him with a blanket, <laughs> yeah, with a blanket so that you can't see it on the road. And when we were driving into this place, it was, a, it was down by um, a place called Alamo Lake, um, is in the desert, and I saw lights going into, the, turning in the same direction we were turning, and I'm going, why is there anybody out here on this road? All these red lights, all of them, all these, all these red flags. And so, um, I knew that something big was going to happen, I didn't know what it was. Um, Mark Baker, um, who climbed up one of the towers so that he could see, because we were in an ambush area, um, we all wore these different things to, to hide our footprints, and I wore duct tape around my feet, and Mark Davis wore socks over his shoes, and Mark Baker was wearing planks on his feet. So <laughs> laugh, and we had all this macabre humor. It was really silly. And a flare went off, and I was like, everything went in slow motion after that. So there's a flare, and I'm looking up and I'm going, wow, you can see everything, I wonder what's going on. And then I heard all these metallic clicks, click, 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 and then I heard, oh, it's the FBI! And I went, this is a movie, right? <laughs> and I turned around and just hit the road. So it was elbows and assholes all the way down to this wash, and then I started running as fast as I could, and the first thing that happened was I got stuck in my thigh by the stub of a tree. Oh. And it just said, wake up, girlfriend, you have work to do. So I got myself together, <coughs> took some breaths, and started traveling slower and started moving. While the feds were, you know, dealing with my buddies over there, they heard the, you know, I heard the clicks, and they started to run after me, but then they left me and, um, and didn't follow me. And then as I was going down this, 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 um, wash, all of a sudden the lights went on and the helicopter starts up and I've got this two big, great big, it's a, a Black Hawk helicopter, they're huge, they're, they uh, take 18 people into them, they have infrared scopes, they have, they're just unbelievable and it just rises up out of the desert and it's, you know, looking at me and I dive under a, a Palo Verde tree which is one of these um, green trees that's um, 
it's a desert tree and it's kind of low and it's got lots of branches and so I just curled up around the trunk because I knew that they had infrared scopes and they were looking at me. So I took my glasses off and stuck them in my pocket and um, I was dressed appropriately, had my little clandestine stuff on. And, um, and I just waited there for them to shoot me or whatever they were going to do and they didn't. They flew away, away from me. And then I untangled myself and started moving. And I was moving towards the lip of the bowl that we were in. And I went to, there's a little saddle up there. And so I thought, well, I'll just go to that. Um, there was a, a road about mm, some miles away. And that road led to the highway uh, from Wendon, which was the little town that we you know, turned off on. And I was on my way back to, um, I didn't know. I was just on my way, so I was leaving. So I followed. Um, I followed just the the trail. I got really. Uh, there wasn't a trail. I just followed my senses. I don't know. Does anybody here read any of the Carlos Castaneda books? Right. And there's yeah. There's a guy um, he talked about Don Juan talking about the just getting into this stance mm -hmm. where you're just you're being pulled from your dantian. And so I kind of got into that. I was really hyper vigilant. I walked among deer, which didn't run away. I walked among javelina, which didn't run away. Um, I sat down to rest, and there was a rabbit, and he didn't run away. So I felt like I was really part of the desert. And I grew up in the desert, and so I'm very aware of um, what the desert has to offer. I did not get stuck one time by any cactus anywhere. And I'm walking. Yeah. This is a moonless night. We made sure that it was a moonless night. And so the starlight was what I was looking at. And I kind of had to go into this. First of all, I can't see very well. <laughs> yeah. So I take my glasses off and I had to just kind of go by the Braille method. So I wasn't really seeing. Eventually I got to the place where I could see this row of lights. And when I started to look around, there was a row all the way around me. And I was like, oh, I'm surrounded. So... Uh, <laughs> So they were moving towards me, and I was moving towards them. And um, oh, and there was, you know, I could hear. It was crazy. When I finally got up to the to the um, to the top of the, well, first I had to get through the line. So they're coming towards me, and I'm coming towards them. And they have this thing where they go one, two, three, four, stop, shine their lights. Mm. One, two, three, four, stop, shine their lights. So I did the same thing. One, two, three, four, stop. I'm a cactus. One, two, three, four, stop. I'm a tree. One, two, three, four, stop. So it got to the place where I'm, there's the cops. There's me. One, two, three, four, stop. One, two, three, four, stop. So that was how I got through their lines. So it's like da 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 da. Wow. da, 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 da. So um, it was very interesting, and um, and you know I had fun with it because it was like, well, you know, I'll either get caught or I won't, so you never know. So I got through, and on the other side, when I couldn't hear them, I started running like as fast as I could, and so I finally ended up on the up in you know in the saddle, and I'm looking around, and I'm looking down into the 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 place where I had just been, and there is like, the place was crawling with cars and trucks and, and lights, and there were planes flying overhead and all this shit. And I'm like, what is this going on here? And then that, that damn helicopter came back about four times, and every time it came back, I'm like, dive underneath another Palo Verde tree, and I'm just like, okay, I'm waiting. They're gonna kill me. And they never did. I didn't want to look up. I didn't want them to see the, the, my eyes. You know, there would be shine on them if they had lights on me. So they never found me. Um, oh. Eventually, I thought, okay, I'm such a bad girl. <laughs> I'm going to give myself up. <laughs> I know I've done some terrible thing. And so, <laughs> this is the best part. I swear to God, these people. So they're driving up and down the road. So I know where the road is. And I go, okay, good. I know where the road is. I can stay on this in this wash, and then when the wash goes away, then I can get on the, you know, on the other side of the road if I need to. And uh, I just wait for them to stop driving, and I go on the other side of the road and keep going. 
And so I knew where I was going. I, I saw the town and all that kind of stuff. And then I just felt so bad because I would hear them say they had bullhorns in the back of their trucks and they'd go, Peggy Millet, we have your identity, give yourself up. And so they go, Peggy Millet, we have your identity. I'm like, nobody calls me Peggy. <laughs> my mother calls me Peggy. So, um, so anyway, so this stuff is going on in my mind. And, and then the tape, you know, the tape that you're born with, it's, you know, you don't even know you have, the misogynistic tape, the, all the tapes that, you know, you just grow up with was running in my head and you're a bad girl and you're going to go to jail and you're going to be, you know, they're, you're not nice and they're, ba they're mad at you and all that kind of <laughs> shit. That sort of was running. So I said, oh my God, I'll give myself up. Oh my God. So I get out on the road and I don't want them to shoot me. So I get on my knees and I don't, I want them to know that I'm unarmed. So, cause you know, they're really scared that we're going to be armed, yeah. right? Like, I don't even have a gun, I haven't ever had a gun. So anyway, but we're armed. We're dangerous. So I put my hands out, I'm on my knees, and a car runs by. <laughs> I'm like, what? And then another one comes by. And then another one comes by, and I about six times, and I finally broke the tape in my head, and I went, okay, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and so I got up, stomped away, and went, okay. Okay, I'm done. I, I broke the tape. It's out of my head, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. So then I, then I started getting really serious about because I had to go through farmer's fields now, which is there's no cover in farmer's fields. I'm in the desert, and um, I'm hanging out. I'm, I watch. Everything is crystal clear to me. I can still see it in my mind. I watch the stars move across the sky for this, you know, and we had a really low... Um, the, the moon came up really late, almost at dawn, and I was just like, oh, man. <coughs> so I was, I knew that I was going to jail. I knew that I was going to jail because they spent so much money on all that shit. <laughs> they are going to put me in jail just for the money they spent on all that crap out there. Why in the world are they putting, there was 50 guys trying to catch me, you know, had the circle that they were, you know, moving in on me and everything. And, it's, and I don't know how many planes, there was one guy, helicopter, they had horses, they had dogs, they had everybody and their brother was out there trying to find me. And the thing is, they told the, the regular, you know, the county cops and all the guys that, that work out there all the time that it was a drug cartel that they were dealing with. Huh? <laughs> so I was very dangerous. So anyway, so I'm sitting down kind of gathering my wits about me and going, okay, what am I going to do? I can go to Alaska. I know how to do that. I know how to hitchhike. I know how to be invisible. I've been invisible all my life. I was always, when I was an activist, doing stuff in public, I was always wearing a raccoon suit. So I've always knew how to be invisible. So I was, I was invisible. Uh, although the FBI said, Peggy Mellon, we have your identity. So they knew who I was. So I started thinking about that. Okay, so do I want to go underground? Do I want to just stand up and be counted? Or how do I want to do this? And um, I thought, well, if I went underground, I would have to lose my identity, and I could not, you know, I, I had to go to Alaska. I didn't think I could do horses up there, so I thought about that. I, I lived in Alaska in the 70s, and I fished for salmon in Alaska up there, and I had a very adventurous life, and it was really wonderful. And I met people up there. There were a lot of felons up there, mm -hmm. and they were protected by their fellow people. So um, when the feds went up there looking for someone, they never found them. So I knew that if I went to Alaska, I would be safe because I knew that people up there would take care of you. And they don't ask you who you are or where you're from. <laughs> they don't care. If you know how to work, if you know how to be a, a real person, they're fine with you. If you're not an asshole, you're great. You're all right in, Al in Alaska. So that was a very serious consideration that I was going through in my mind when I was thinking about this. Um, after the the bozos didn't pick me up. I thought, okay, so I really have to get serious about what am I going to do now. So I still had a few miles. It was about 16 miles that I walked that night. I didn't have any water. Mm. Um, it, was in, it was May 30th, 30th or 31st. I don't know. It was the last day of May. And so, um, so I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do? I can't go home because I know the place is going to be crawling with feds. And I can't go to where my truck is because the place is going to be crawling with feds, so I have to go somewhere else. Well, I, I know. I'll go to work. Huh? 
denial is not just a river of Egypt. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay, but first I have to get to Wendon, which is way over there, and I have to go through lots of farmer's fields, and I felt terrible about walking through farmer's fields because I thought I was trespassing. Oh my God. <laughs> So I'm sneaking around through these farmer's fields and there's still cops, you know, they got the lights on and everything and I'm laying down in the cornrows or whatever they are and I'm laying down whenever I see one and it's, it's finally, it's, you know, it's dawn and there's, or before dawn and the farmers are getting up and they're starting to get their act together to do, and I'm walking by houses and I can smell coffee and I'm just like, oh man. <laughs> and I'm not happy but I'm moving and so I finally get to the corner. I'm thinking, okay, I know who I can call. I, I have this friend. He's a John Bircher. He works for the Forest Service. He's a he's the <laughs> surveyor there, and he has a like this huge uh, safe full of guns. And um, he loves the the book um, uh, Field Guide to Monkey Ranching because he has land not far from where I live in the mountains, and he really liked the the section on how to sabotage trappers because he hated the trappers that were out there and they'd be trapping all these you know predators and stuff like that he just hated that so he got the book and really liked the book and did a really nice job of taking out all the traps in the area and breaking them and so um so i knew that i could call him because he really got what we were doing it was pretty cool so i was going to call him at the corner store which was very naive because when i got to the corner store i was hiding behind some little bushes <laughs> and um, i was looking at what was going on at the corner store and it was full of cops and cars and trucks and guys with stuff and i was like i guess i better not try and make a phone call over there so i ended up um I ended up crossing the street in front of them, their lights were everywhere, and I was just like, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an old man. <laughs> so I walked <laughs> across the street in front of them <laughs> until I got to the other side. And then I ran like crazy until I got out of town. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, they didn't catch me. I can't believe this. And so, because I was in full view. I was right in front of them. And so I was like, okay, so I'm good. So I kept on going. I got it under a bridge and I pulled out all the rocks in my shoes and sat there and cried a little bit and shit like that. And I was like, what am I gonna do? And I said, well, I know, I'll hitchhike home. <laughs> so I'm gonna hitchhike home 65 miles to get to Prescott. And so I ended up on the road hitchhiking and I was very sure that I was going to get picked up by the feds but I wasn't they didn't even have any roadblocks or anything but um so I did make it to I got picked up by a Mormon and I told him I was from Blythe California and I broke down there and I was trying to get to Prescott and I couldn't go and I, you know I was married or I wasn't married I had a ring on but I wasn't married and so the guy listened to me and he Gave me some tab, which I'll never get again because I drank the whole thing. So I was very thirsty, and um, it was just a really amazing, surreal scene. And I was very calm, and he was, you know, very nice, and he talked to me about God and all that kind of stuff. And I said, "Thank you very much. I really needed to hear that because I need to reconnect, <laughs> reconnect." So um, I was connecting with God. My idea, which was a little different than his, but it's relevant. So um, he, I go, I'd like to get dropped off at this, sto at this little cafe. And um, I called my friend that was, you know, that really liked, you know, breaking the traps and stuff. And he came and got me. His name was Gary. And um, he uh, saw that I was rather agitated. He didn't know how to deal with women that were hysterical. <laughs> and I was... You know, he's kind of redneck. <laughs> so I'm at this little place, and the guy wants to feed me. The the guy that picked me up, he wants to feed me. And I'm like, oh, it's hard to even though I can't eat. <laughs> so he goes, oh, I understand. I go, yeah. So he helped me get there, and I was there. And then my friend Gary showed up, and Gary said, oh, what's going on? I said, um, I'm kind of in trouble, so let's get in the car. So we got in the car, and I fell completely apart. I went hysterical. He was like freaking out because he didn't know what to do with me because mm -hmm. I was hysterical. And um, he took me to his house, got me a shower, got me some clothes, and mm -hmm. took me 
Oh, I called my mom. I go, Mom, do you know anybody that's a good lawyer? <laughs> I've been chased around by the FBI all night. <sighs> and uh, she goes, oh, my God. My brother had a, a needed a lawyer once because he was, you know, selling cocaine. <laughs> 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 so, um, I come from a, a pretty good, you know, kind of a, what they call trailer trash kind of a family. <laughs> but anyway, so he went to jail, but he had a really good lawyer, and so I thought maybe that lawyer would help me. I don't know. Um, but um, it was kind of a different deal. I wasn't involved in drugs, so they, he didn't really know how to deal with me. So um, I called her, and then I called work, and they said, well, I was told you were in jail. I said, well, I'm not. Do you still want me to come in? <laughs> <laughs> And so I went. It worked. <laughs> so I called. I called. I didn't call Doug because I knew I couldn't call Doug because we didn't have a phone. This is in the '80s, and we don't. We didn't, we lived out of town, a long ways, and the only connection we had with the world was the dispatcher radio. <laughs> so there were no cell phones or any of that kind of stuff. And so um, I didn't. Call, I couldn't call Doug. And finally, but the feds were at the house oh, at six nice. o'clock in the morning, and they totally tore it apart. And they mm -hmm. found my stuff. And Doug was getting ready to host a Boy Scout troop. Oh. And they told the Boy Scout troop that they were going through the house for drugs. Now oh. my beloved husband had ever nothing ever 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 to do with drugs, and um, you know nothing. He was complete squeaky clean. So that was really devastating for him and for me too because I was like you bastards how could you do that to my you know he's just like he was like Dudley do right I mean he totally was you know upstanding very uh. so anyway so I ended up at work my friend Ilsa shows up she goes what are you doing here get out of here come on with me because she had her house had been um, had also been raided Whoa. and that's where my truck was and of course the feds were there because they were going to wait for me and I wasn't coming home because they couldn't find me well actually they thought I was still out in the desert and so um, so they were trying to get her intimidated she had all the kids she took them for the for the night so there was Mark Davis's kids her kids and Mark Baker's kids they were all in her house they told her they were going to take the kids away she said over my dead body motherfuckers get out of here <laughs> and they left. They didn't have a warrant. But it's like, you don't mess with a mama bear. I mean, she was, she's like, oh, I don't think so. She was scared to death. But there was no way they were going to take those kids from her. And so she ended up, um, she, it was hysterical. She's, she's, getting, she's walking outside with the laundry in her arms. And these people are driving up in all these cars. And they've got guns. And they're going to, you know, and she's standing there with her laundry looking at all this going, oh shit, I guess they got caught. So she, um, she came to work because she didn't know what else to do. And she saw me there and she said, let's get out of here. They're after us. And I said, well, I know, I know. But I was still in the state, the capital of the state of denial. So I didn't go, which probably would have been a lot better if I went with her. And um, she was way more realistic than I was. I was completely still so naive oh my god I was so stupid but anyway um so she left and took the kids and was you know going on with her life well the best she could because she knew that Mark was in jail and and she had been living with him she had just moved downstairs they had a warrant for his house they did not have a warrant for her house so it was very lucky that she did not that they didn't go through her place so anyway so she ended up not being arrested for six months because they thought they could turn her. They worked very hard at turning her. Mm -hmm. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that she would never turn. And, um, and they thought that she would because she's a Southern Belle and she knows exactly how to work the crowd. And so she had them stringing along mm -hmm. just enough. And uh, man, she's from, you know, she's amazing. But anyway, so she was able to run interference outside. We were in jail. I ended up going to jail that day. Um, the FBI had their their uh, leftover guys were you know called in. These guys were from Flagstaff and they didn't know anything about the case. They were just told you know a need to know basis. So they had to come and get me. I was at the I was at work and I'm I'm in work and I'm wearing my little coat that says Planned Parenthood on it because I'm working at Planned Parenthood and um, these guys are sneaking around and I go shit they're here. 
I got a phone call from my husband. He goes, Peg, you're in big trouble. I go, oh yeah, I know that. <laughs> he says, well, they went to the house and they totally trashed it and they, you know, this and that and everything else. But he was in town when he called me. He was in the, at the Forest Service office and he said they just left here and um, they had told me that they were going to go back out in the desert. And he says, well, don't bother <laughs> because she's at work. <laughs> oh no. He's deadly do right, man. He doesn't tell a lot. So they came to work and they got me. And uh, one of them was a rookie who had been a cop. And um, he was totally amazed. And so he walks in the door and then he's the good cop and then there's the bad cop. And he shows up and he shows his badge and he says, you're under arrest. And I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> And the girl, who, Linda, who was working at the desk, saw this and went, Oh my God, Peg, you lead the most exciting life of anybody I've ever met. This is a sitcom or some shit. Yeah, right. And so I'm like, yeah. She goes, what are you getting arrested for? And he goes, she knows. And I go, oh yeah, I know. And so then my boss is like, I said, look, you can arrest me and all that kind of crap, but you're not locking me out of here with this coat on, so you better take these off first. I'm going to take the coat off, and then I'll go outside. And my boss walks over to the door. He says, yeah, I'm going to let her take her coat off. And the guy's just like, they're looking. They have the guns. They've got guns. They're sticking their looking at us with their guns. And we're like, sorry, you're going to let her take the coat off. So I said, Planned Parenthood is not getting arrested. And we had so many people coming down and freaking out and all that kind of stuff. And we had the Christians and oh my God. And so we were always in the news. And it was like, so I am not going to put any more fodder for the, you know, the masses to be yelling and screaming about us. And so the cop took my cuffs off and let me, with great flair, take off my coat and put it on the desk. And, that, and there was this poor lady, an old lady, she was a, she was a volunteer there, and she was just blathering at the end, like, oh my god, oh my god, she was so scared. So finally I put my hands out again, they kept, they put me, oh, and then one thing that he did that was really amazing is he walks up to me and goes, you must be really good at what you do. And I go, what do I do? <laughs> because you just evaded 50 guys on foot, that terrorist, anti-terrorist team, and the SWAT teams, and bloody, bloody, blah. I go, and we were worried about you. He said that. I go, oh, no, really? You weren't worried about me. You were embarrassed because a girl got away. <laughs> and he got over being in awe of me at that moment. So, and he was all business after that. But I'm the cops and take me to the sheriff's office and of course I know all the sheriffs because I work for the forest service <laughs> and they come to my house I feed them pie and coffee and all that kind of shit well they weren't looking at me when they saw me <laughs> like I didn't exist and oh my god oh my god so it's very interesting to uh, go through that I go oh, hi how's it going I don't know her I don't have any idea what this person is and stuff so that was my experience and it's like okay Get ready for your whole life to change. I mean, well, when the light went on, when the flare went off, I knew that my life was over as I knew it. It was never going to be the same. And that is exactly what happened. And I'm still here, and I'm having a great time, so I didn't die. So I thought I was going to, but it didn't happen. So um, it was a major, major ordeal. So they ended up uh, taking me down to Phoenix. Um, this is about personal power as well. And uh, the bad cop, good cop were... They were talking to me and they're telling me things like, oh, well, you know, we went over to your husband's place. It's really a nice place. Too bad you're going to just lose it. And so they're, you know, doing all this stuff to make me feel bad and everything. And I'm asking them how the weather is and, you know, what kind of, you know, car they drive and that kind of shit. And so they're asking me all these questions like my name and my social security. And I go, you know all that stuff. I don't need to tell you that. <laughs> so I didn't talk to them about any of that stuff. And finally, they're going to hand me off to the guys from Phoenix that have been out in the desert looking for me all night and they're all pissed off because I'm not there. <laughs> and, um, and it's embarrassing too. And, um, and then I let them know that it was embarrassing. And oh, and the other thing is they were gonna tie my arms behind my back and I said, no, you're not. And they're just looking at me like, you don't tell us what to do. And I said, you're gonna put my arms in front of me and I'm gonna sit down with my arms in front of me because I saw you had, in your trunk, you had a belt that you will put around my waist. And they went to the truck and they got the bill and they put it around my waist. So I sat with my hands in front of me. 
So then they're going to put me in another car, and these are the bad, these are the, this, the rookies were the ones that first got me in the, in the place. And then the bad guys from Phoenix are, you know, they're mad and all that kind of stuff. So they're going to come out and they're going to frisk me, right? So I'm wearing this little tiny skirt that's really skinny because I had it stashed at work and I didn't have clothes over at my friend's house. So I'm wearing a t-shirt and, uh, and this thing and I'm not wearing anything else because I threw away all my other clothes. And, um, and they're going to frisk me. I said, no, you're not. You're not going to frisk me. Come on, you guys. You know I don't have any guns on me. I said, if you frisk me, I will scream at the top of my lungs. And all those people that are over in that little cafe over there that are looking through the door and the windows right now are going to hear it. You're not going to frisk me. So they didn't. Put me in the car. Drove me down to Phoenix. I sang the whole way. <laughs> I uh, sang blues songs. I was really bumming. I was not sure what was going to happen. I was very tired. And then they interrogated me. And that's when they found out that they weren't going to be able to get any other names or anything like that. And they also found out that I wasn't afraid. By this time, I was so punch drunk that I was laughing at everything. <laughs> so um, they also knew that I didn't do drugs and I didn't drink. And so, um, but they wanted to try anyways. They were going to give me a drug test. I said, knock yourself out. Let's just knock yourself out. So um, I ended up going into the county jail for the first time at about 2 o'clock in the morning. They took a whole roll of film to get the face that went on the AP wire because I was laughing. Oh, we were trying to get serious. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. The one they put on, the, on me that I had to wear in jail all the time was me laughing. So um, it took them a long time to process me because I wasn't being a terrorist enough. So um, yeah, it was really interesting. So my life Changed irrevocably after that. Um, I curled up on, um, I really, when I was going through the desert, um, my power animals are the raccoon and the, red, the ring tail cat. And uh, when I was going through the desert, I felt like I was protected by their tails. I was protected by the ring tail cat. I felt um, that I needed to really take in every single detail of that night so that I could carry it with me because I was going to prison. I knew that. And so um, I really spent that night remembering every detail. I can still bring it up. I can still feel it. I can still see it. I can smell it. And, um, and that's about living mindfully. And so um, I know how to do it. I don't do it as much as I would like to. I'm trying to learn how to live mindfully all of my life. And um, that was a really big exercise for me mm. when that happened. And so. Um, so that was my experience of getting arrested and going to jail. Um, if people want to ask questions, please. Yeah, actually, got, uh, let's give Peg a round of applause quick. Yeah. I'm going to pass the hat around while people are asking questions. Uh, I think that there might be some songs people want to take this in. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So, I um, sing one. She might be able to do that. And I'm also going to pass around a little box and just come over with these booklets in it. People can take them and then afterwards have a sign if you want. So. Yeah, I promised that I would sing the song I sang in court. <laughs> but you had a question? Yeah, it's, um, it's one that will probably sound a little tangential, but I'm really stuck on the centipede. <laughs> <laughs> How big was the centipede? But you, oh, you it wasn't that big. I mean, how big are they in Arizona? That's big. Is that big? <laughs> yeah, he just he went over my foot and they have the poison on their toes, on their feet. Yeah. And so when he walked over my foot I could feel it stinging me. Oh. And so that's when I jumped up and said, Oh my god, what's that? And then when he put the light on, I said, Oh cool, it's a therapy. And so he was gonna stop it. And I'm like, What are you doing? I've like, never I've never seen one that thing. Oh, well, I live in Arizona. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> you know, sure, anytime. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? <laughs> Details or anything like that? Is there people that are familiar with this story at all? No. Is this a new, a new story for you guys? So, so. Um, well, it is in this little booklet. <laughs> Actually, not the whole thing. He just kind of did an interview. I think it's really interesting because 
Um, there's legendary. There's the legend of this thing, and I, I go. To, I went to Prescott College, and the students there. It's hilarious. Um, because I, I was I graduated from there. Um, I'm legendary in their <laughs> lore of the school, and I hear people tell the story that about us, and it's completely has nothing to do with the. What, what I went through or what I experienced and each one of us that was involved like Mark and Mark and Ilsa and me and Dave Foreman I mean Dave Foreman was arrested as well and they tried very hard to keep him connected with us when we went through the trial but um, the stories are just get twisted up I mean people had me sleeping with the FBI agent and all this stuff I'm like well no <laughs> and so there's a lot of um, lore out there now because it's over 20 years ago that um, you know uh, when I'm telling my version it's very different than Ilsa's version because she was different in a different situation. Did you have to with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you, you've said a couple of times that your life changed irrevocably. Yeah, I lost my husband, I lost my house, I lost my ability to work for the Forest Service. Um, I don't have a job now because my fingerprint card was taken away. I was working at a crisis youth shelter for 11, 12 years after I got out of jail. And um, because of 9-11, they changed the laws, so I am a felon. I spent two years in prison, and I cannot get a fingerprint card, and I was working at a, a, a crisis youth shelter, residential crisis youth shelter, and so that was what I was, you know. So I'm, I'm cleaning houses now. That's what I'm making my money oh. doing. So I'm kind of off the radar, and we got. I was Mark and I both. Mark Baker, Dave, uh, Mark Davis, and I both got nineteen thousand dollars restitution that we were supposed to pay. Hmm. So when I talked to the lady that I'm supposed to pay to, I'm just like, well, she goes, well, can you give us fifty dollars a month? And I go, <laughs> probably not. I'll give you twenty five. She goes, oh, really? I go, yeah. So I paid twenty five dollars a month for a long time, and they. They gave me little envelopes to pay with it and everything. I figured it was probably going to cigars and beer for the people yeah. that were working there, but I don't know. And um, it was it was going to Fairfield because Fairfield was the company that tried to own um, the the um, peaks um, and to do the ski lift thing. And that's what we got evic that's what we got convicted on because um, they had a lot of counts on us, but they couldn't really make them stick. So that's the only one that stuck. And um, that was before, you know, like Free and a couple of the other guys were, you know, doing 22 years for, you know, burning a couple of SUVs somewhere. And it's like, holy crap. So things got really oh. dicey after that for activists like us. And, um, and yeah, I ended up, um, so I lost my job in 2010. Huh. And so I've been, you know, so it's made, it's definitely affected my life. And, you know, when I go someplace and I meet people and they find out that I, you know, if they've read anything about it in the mainstream media, they, they just, I'm a terrorist. I'm, I'm listed with my, oh yeah, I'm a domestic terrorist. What were you convicted of? I was convicted of aiding and abetting malicious destruction of property. But here's the deal. That got taken away. It's out of the records. And now, because I had to go back, I tried to get my fingerprint card back and it got turned into something entirely different and I wasn't even, um, a, it says I was arrested the day I went into jail, to prison. So the, everything's been tampered with, all of the records have been tampered with, all of the transcripts for our trial were in the dumpster after our trial was over. So they, don't, they didn't want anybody to know what was going on. I have evidence of our trial because I, I put together a couple of big um, scrapbooks. That's all there is. And I tried to find out where I could get records of the trial, and they said, oh, it's in microfiche, and it's in California. Yeah. So I couldn't get any of the information so that I could bring it to the, and it's not there anymore. It's changed. They've changed it. I couldn't get it from my lawyer, yeah? Um, uh, well, one I would like to, to hear uh, the song. Um, oh, forever while. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I was going to sing more, but I guess I just started talking. Okay, so I'm going to tell a story about forever while. 
Forever Wild <clears throat> was written by a guy named Jim Stoltz. And he spent his life walking from, for thousands and thousands of miles. And he, had, and he walked in the wilderness areas because he wanted to bring attention to the wilderness areas. And he wrote beautiful, beautiful, beautiful songs. And that song is one of them. And he spent, he's dead now. He finally, he finally died. He had you know, some horrible nasty disease that kept him kind of skinny. But he still kept walking. And so they called him Walking Jim Stoltz. And I think he still has a website out there. And he is one of the most amazing people I've ever met. I saw him the first time in Idaho. We were at the, um, at the rendezvous and he was coming down the mountain and he was following a mountain goat because he didn't know how to get down the mountain and he followed the goat down the mountain. It was unbelievable. We were standing in the, in the um, fields watching him come down and going, how in the hell? And he's got a guitar on his back and, you know, he's backpacking. And so I sat in the fire, you know, in the fire ring um, after he came down and heard this song and wept majorly. And uh, hey, um, I, I have to go because I have to pick somebody up, but I wanted to thank you because I really appreciate it, and I'm not leaving because I'm not interested. Oh, thank, so thank, you. You. thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, have a nice trip. Um, okay, so for everyone, I'm going to try to sing this if I don't remember the words. So for a while, um, Walking Jim Stoltz sang this song for the first time in front of, uh, the, uh, the first time I heard it, it was around a campfire, and the second time I heard it, it was, um, he was singing it to a judge, and he was singing it to a judge in, um, uh, uh, we were up in Yellowstone, and they were trying to put, um, take grizzly habitat and turn it into RV parks, and we were like, no, 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 you're going to have to kill a lot of grizzlies to do that, and so, um, he sat on the, he, the first time he ever got arrested in his whole life, and he sang this song to the judge. <laughs> and so my lawyer, after we'd been in trial for two months, say, said to me, Peg, is there some way, now he knew this, he knew what the answer was going to be to this, that you could show some remorse? And I said, no, I don't think so. He said, think of something, please, because you are going to have a chance to talk to the judge, and it's possible, it's possible that he might not give you three years. They told us they were going to give us 35 years, and they really wanted to, but they really couldn't because they didn't have anything else. So I said, well, let me think about it. So I went home, and I went up on the mountain, and I started praying, and I did a bunch of stuff, and a little altar, and stuff like that, and I get this little voice that says, you're going to sing, and I said, no, oh, no, I'm not, and I said, oh, yes, you are, <laughs> and then this song is the song that I was going to sing. So um, when I told my lawyer that I was going to sing, he was like, he'd known me for a couple of years now, and so he knew that I was not your regular, he'd never been around anybody like me that was not a criminal. He's like, you guys aren't criminals. I go, yeah, I know. He goes, I've never had to deal with people like you before. I said, sorry. So uh, I told him I was going to sing a song, and he had a lot of trouble at first, and then he started thinking about it, and he was pretty flamboyant, and he said, you know, I think that's just great. So I was terrified. The judge we had was named Bloomfield, and he when Broomfield and when uh, Mike Black, my lawyer, came to me and told me that who that guy was going to be, he said, you know, this I just saw him and I was just in front of him and he is a malicious man. So you're screwed. And I said, okay. <laughs> Thanks for the info. <laughs> so, um, so I'm in this, I'm in the courtroom, the place is packed with the raptors, we've got, you know, the FBI agents sitting over there, we are doing a plea bargain. <gasps> is my only time that I get a chance to talk and nobody had ever addressed what we were doing this stuff for. Most everything that we did was on sacred lands and for sacred lands and for, you know, the sovereignty of the land and I said, so we haven't really addressed what we're here for yet, so I'm going to address it now. Let's see if I can get this. There's a magic in the air that I feel when I am there. It plays straight for my heart and it lays it all bare. It's in the cry of an eagle and the deer so and mild. It's in the rise of a mountain. Let it stay forever wild. Forever wild. 
Well, it's in all that is not tame, and some that can't be named. It's in the fog down in the valley, and the scent of summer rain. It's in the scream of a lion, when she's sounding like a child. It's in the song of a river, let it stay forever wild, forever wild, forever wild, let it stay forever wild. Well now the earth she holds the key to all that shall be free. It's in the priest of the desert and the wisdom of the trees. It's in the grace of a swan's wing and a grizzly when he's riled. It's in all the love I bear it. Let it stay forever wild, forever wild, forever wild. Let it stay forever wild. Well, there are those of our own kind. They're running fast and going blind. And the only thing they worship is power and the dollar sign. Well, we are fighting them with our spirit, with our life and with our guile. We are showing them that the answer is to stay forever wild. Yes, I did. Yes. Um, on Mount Graham, uh, the courts used a, a numbers game against the Apache. Yes. They said there's not many of these doing it. Right. Um, and they, that, that's the same uh, approach that the, the federal courts take yeah. against all signal Yes. Uh, it's, it, it's, you stand more of a chance of protecting an area if you can find something like the red squirrel. That's what we did. Ground. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, while at the same time, those religious practices mm -hmm. are uh, sort of pushed into the corner by the bigger environmental groups. Yes. We have had an issue with them for a very long time. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Uh, there, there have been, uh, in the late 80s and 90s, I know Bill County, Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, was the birth of the um, uh, Dene care, so this is going to ruin the, ruin the environment. Yeah. College student came back for Easter break. Uh-huh. And um, the uh, hazardous waste company uh, had been telling the, the, the elders, who didn't speak much English at all. You're right. Um, yeah, it's a place to burn your garbage. Yeah. And so the elders said, well, you know, that's good. It's good to have a place to burn the garbage. Mm -hmm. And then the student said, well, uh, yeah, this is hazardous waste. <laughs> yeah. And so then, the ball started growing. Yeah. Out of that came groups like the Indigenous Environmental Network. Yes. Um, who, many of those people were uh, the spouses of uh, some of the AIM leaders. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. There's still a major struggle going on in the pe over the peaks right now that, oh, yeah. um, that, that is about, that they're using effluent to put snow on the peaks right now. Yeah. And they're trying to put in another mine for pumice and that sort of thing. And um, 
there's a group of people, there's a guy named Clee Benali who is unbelievable, you know him? Yes. So he's been extremely vocal and a focal point um, on that that fight and um, there's still lots going on up there. There's a lot of people that are still involved. At the same time as this, this thing was going through, guys like Wendell Chino yeah. were uh, persecuting activists on the Apache Reservation. Oh, wow. So, someone whose house was shot up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's she the wasn't hit. Uh, that was in the you know, the, I think that was 91, 92. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was really involved with Mount Graham until I got arrested and then I kind of got out but, of it. But, but really, uh, Ongo Hawe, or uh, that's my name for uh, me, uh -huh. the Seneca, uh -huh. um, or other Native people, mm -hmm. we do not have a choice when it comes to protecting the mother. Oh, I know. When it comes to protecting yeah. the environment. Yeah. Whether it's because of sacred sites, or anything else, yeah. because we are the caretakers of the earth. Yeah. Well, and so all we don't have that. a choice. Yeah. But it's happened many times where we've had environmental uh, groups kind yeah. of push us to push those issues to the side. Yeah. They like us to come out and pray. Yeah. Sing yeah, a song, yeah. 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 You know. But. Um, well, we had that same problem when we tried to enlist the guys to help us when we went and did this ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, like, we want to, you know. It's like, well, we would like you to just be our support. How's that? Mm -hmm. And that was how we approached people, at least people that I was working with. We would approach the, pe the native peoples and say, look, we're at your service. What would you like us to do? And we did what they wanted us to do to support their um, focus and stuff. Because to me, the land is sacred and that's what I'm, that's what I'm fighting for. I don't, I mean, the red squirrel was, was a, uh, a selling point and it was, it got them on the map. And it also made it possible for us to do what, what we were able to do to, to stop it. But the, the real reason why I was there was not because of the Red Squirrel. <laughs> I mean, the Red Squirrel was part of it, of course, but yeah. But in the courts, that's the way it works. Oh, I know, you know I know. We so are, it's not I, a level playing field at all. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm doing it for the reasons you were doing it. Oh, for. thank you. Thank and you very much. For the same reasons that we do it. That you're doing it, yeah. Well, we are all, it's all us, really. The earth is our home it's our life it's our mother so if we don't pay attention to that whether we know it or not it's the way it is so it would be wonderful to see you come here do you know Rod Coronado then I might. okay he's hopefully coming if you guys can get enough money over to, to, you know so if you guys can can bring him here he is one of the most amazing, he is a warrior that I am just so honored to know that he's just unbelievable. He's unbelievable. He's Yaqui and Mexican. He's, he's half Yaqui, half Mexican. I probably do if he was involved with that end and He um, was involved mostly with animal stuff. And so he's involved, he was in, he was on the Sea Shepherd for a while and then he worked, he worked with PETA for a while. And he, one of the things that he did was he went underground to the fur farms and took all kinds of footage of what was going on at the fur farms and then at the end he bought a fur farmer out and then he took every one of those animals and he rehabilitated them and then he brought them to freedom in the boreal forest. He, they were minks and, um, and uh, lynx and bobcats. So he is an amazing soul. Amazing, amazing. So yes, come if they can get him out here, he definitely... The, the other thing that we, that we know very well is that these developers, we might put them off for a while, but they always come back. Yeah. And we will never stop. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, That's the thing that they didn't figure out yet, so it's true. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, well, yeah, I was just... Uh, well, just a couple of things. Well, one is that, like, a lot of people now, I hear a lot, like, talk about the NSA and all the technology that's happening. People are like, oh, well, that's been going on forever. Well, yeah, that's, that's my point. <laughs> yeah. And, like, and just, just your story of, of, like, being there with all those cops um, and not being able to find you and, like, walking across them. And, like, and there was a, a man locally named Bucky Phillips who was oh, yeah. from way and he, They couldn't find him. They had, like, the entire state troop for that. But, but I, you know, I mean... What I think part of the bookstore is like we want to show people stories. It's like you don't have to cower to these people and you don't have to cower right. what they say. 
fear yeah, is, yeah. If, if you're afraid, uh, being afraid is, is a good thing if you don't let it walk in front of you. Mm. If you can walk with fear as a companion and as, as a cautionary um, mm. uh, um, help, then it's okay. But if you let it take you over, then they won. Yes. Could you say a little bit more about how you don't let it take you over? <laughs> Spiritual path. The invisible world is much bigger than um, they know. If they know that it is bigger than, than um, what is apparent. One of the things is learning your own power. And like when, when I was telling about the FBI, you know, doing what I told them to when they were going to cuff me and all that kind of stuff and just standing there and just ordering them around and them doing it, that's personal power. Um, I was in prison for two years, and um, people didn't mess with me, not because I was mean, because I was crazy, and um, and I, I not because I was uh, flailing around or anything like that, but I was definitely somebody. the The Mexican women were very afraid of me. They called me a bruja, but when they had dreams, they would come to me and ask for an interpretation. So it was very interesting, and I didn't, you know, I didn't try to cultivate that or anything, but it was very, it's, it's getting a path, and I don't give a shit if it's got Christ in it or not. I mean, I don't tell people that I'm a Christian, I'm not, but I have a cosmology that includes that. So it's very inclusive, and, and everyone has a connection, a place that they connect to the planet and to, to spirit, and and that is your path. So there are many paths to the top of the mountain, and I just really, really encourage people, especially if they're going to do dangerous stuff that goes against the current, to really get in that place and live that way. Your song about um, the relationship between fear and power mm -hmm. reminds me of Starhawk. Yeah, I came from her collective. I thought so. Yeah. 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 Did you, so you must have read the fifth sacred thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I've worked with her, too. We've been I on the her. same demos together and stuff like that. She's amazing. I did a class with her called the Earth Activist Training, uh -huh. and it was two weeks long, and it was her and um, Penny Livingston Stark, and they uh, did a permaculture course, and it was about <laughs> magic. She's still doing that. Definitely. Yeah. She just had one. I really strongly recommend that book to everybody in this room. Oh, yes, to the fifth exactly sacred thing. What Peg is talking about. Yeah. Oh, it's a wonderful, uh, yeah, fifth sacred thing. Yes. You can maybe take one more and then. Yeah. Did you have one? No, I was just wondering why did the Vatican want to put a telescope on Mount Graham? They were going to go to other planets and Christianize them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> no, they're part of the cartel. So. <laughs> They're Illuminati. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. But yeah, that was their story. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Huh? So did I go way over time? Um, no, it is getting late, so let's give a round of applause. Okay. <laughs>